The reading this morning comes from the uh, Gospel of Matthew. We're in uh, chapter 11, verse 25 to 30. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of God. Thank you. Well, good morning. That was, that was not as good as earlier. Good morning. Well, it is a, it's a good day to talk about rest. I, uh, we didn't plan to be going through these verses when we looked at the calendar for it to be daylight savings, when we lose an hour, uh, but it is. The Lord is, is uh, sovereign, and he had good plans for us this morning. You just heard that, that text from Matthew 11 written, uh, read by Kurt. Uh, it, is, it is a pretty well-known uh, quotation from Jesus, particularly those last couple verses, uh, and, and it also is, we mentioned this last week, it's also the inspiration for a, a book that we talked about last week, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dane Ortland. And, and it's a book that we, just over these, these last couple weeks, are, are taking time to say, hey, this is a, a great resource for you. It's a book we, we recommend. And, and some of you might be thinking, okay, well, this isn't the Bible. So, so why, why, are we, why are we talking about it so much? Why have we kept uh, recommending it? And that's a, that's a good question. The center of our worship services as a people is always going to be the Word of God. And, and, and that is and should be always our source, the place we go back to. This is the place where God reveals himself to us, where he has given us direct and specific revelation of himself to us. And so our goal is not to turn your eyes away from the Bible to some other source of knowledge. But we do have reasons for highlighting another resource. And there's, there's two reasons. The first reason is that we just want to be honest with you. Uh, a lot, of, as pastors, a lot of our understandings and clarifications of the Bible uh, often come from other sources, other sources that help us understand the Bible. And in this case, this book has been one that has been really helpful for us. And we want to be transparent as pastors uh, that we are, are not innovative. We are not the, the sole uh, in good interpreters of the word of God, but the church itself has done so much work over the last 2,000 years to help one another understand and clarify and apply the word to our lives. And so we want to point you to those other sources. So whether it's someone who we come across who is a, is a great writer and, and has analogies that are helpful, someone like, like C.S. Lewis, or whether it's someone who is just really good at clarifying the word and making it clear to us, uh, and that's something I think this book does a great job of, we want to point you to those things, tried and true resources throughout the history of the church that has helped the church go to the source, go to the word, and see it a little bit more clearly. And I think, I think this book is one of those resources. So I just want to invite you, if you didn't grab one last week, we have them again over there, over on the table. We actually have more than what's on the table over there. So don't be, don't be shy, feel free to grab one. It is, it is a great resource. Now, it's time for us to go to the source material. But before we dig into the words of Jesus that Kurt just read, I want to invite you to bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear Lord, this morning, I feel weary. Lord, I feel physically weary. It was a, it was a long night. It was an early morning. Lord, I know there are people here who are who are here at what felt like 6 a.m. to set up this morning. We are a weary people, Lord. And it's not just our bodies that are weary, Lord. 
We need you this morning. We need you to be present here. So, Lord, as we open up this word and we, we seek your truth and, and your guidance and your comfort and your presence, Lord, we just pray that, that your spirit would be really active here. Lord, would you be active here this morning? Would you be giving us focus as our, as our bodies are tired and, and it is tempting to, to rest our eyes and our minds, Lord, as our, as our minds are distracted, as we're thinking about other things? Lord, would you focus our minds? Would you help me, Lord? as I seek to make clear your word to your people. Would you give me energy? Would you give me wisdom? Would you shut up any words that do not accurately reflect your word, Lord? Lord, you have promised that your word does not return void. So as a people, we grab onto that promise this morning as we open up your word. And we pray these things in the power of your son's name. And everybody said... Amen. Now, as we've been going through the, the book of Matthew for the last few months, we've, we've tried to do our best to give the context for every passage that we've looked at. Uh, you know, we've said before, the, the Bible is not just a collection of short, wise sayings or interesting stories, but it's intentionally crafted, either as a narrative, as we see in the Gospels, or as a, a letter, as we see later on in the New Testament, or history, as we see in the Old Testament. And so we, we rarely will come to the Word and treat a, a couple verses just in isolation. But sometimes we do have a chance to sit and, and look specifically at a few Verses, And that's, that's what we're doing today. We're just looking at a few verses. You heard Kurt read verses 25 through 30, but really, we're going to really focus on those last few verses. Verse 28 through 30. Let me read them one more time. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now these words of Jesus come to you in some context. So before we just zero in on those words, let me me, me paint a little bit of a picture of where we're coming from here. Remember last week, Pastor Ethan was preaching, and he, he preached on Jesus sending out his followers, and and how Jesus looked at the people around him in the world and saw that they were lost, that they were helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus, the text said, had compassion for them. And that compassion is what prompted him to send his followers out on mission to those people. And so that was the end of of chapter 9. If you're you're looking in your Bibles, that was the end of chapter 9. And then throughout chapter 10, Jesus is giving his apostles instructions for what it looks like to go out on mission, to go toward the sinners and the sufferers. And so throughout chapter 10, you'll see him warning them about persecution that's going to come, about danger that is going to to come, about how, how his gospel is actually going to cause conflict amongst people. He warns them about that, but he also tells them, do not have fear. And then as you get into chapter 11, you start seeing some response to the message of Jesus. So you see the followers of John the Baptist come to Jesus and say, okay, so, so are you the one? Are you the one who is bringing about the kingdom of heaven? When, when is this kingdom of heaven really going to appear here on earth? Then you see, you see Jesus uh, rebuke people who had refused his message, who had rejected the message of the kingdom of God. You see that right before our passage as he talks to to the cities of of Chorazin and Bethsaida. And so it's in this context that we get to these words of Jesus. Jesus has sent his followers out on mission, and they've started to get some response, some questioning response, some flat-out rejection. And so it's here where Jesus says, and this is what Kurt read right at the beginning of this passage, where Jesus says, Lord, I thank you for the reality that you have chosen to reveal yourself not to the the high and the wise, but to the little children. So there's there's a couple different people then who Jesus is, is speaking to when he says these words. On one hand, He's speaking to his followers when he says, come and find rest. He's speaking to the people who have have gone out on mission for him and and, and need to be replenished. 
But he's also speaking to the lost who are hearing his message for the first time. And he's inviting them to come and to find rest. And so this morning, as we read those words, they're for all of us. If you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, those words are for you to come to him and to find rest. And if you are, are, are not sure what's going on in church, if you've been to church before, you're familiar with it, but you wouldn't count yourself as a follower of Jesus, or if you're, you're, seeking, you're seeking for the first time, these words are for you. Jesus is saying, come to me, and I will give you rest. Now let's dive into our passage this morning. The first thing we see Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. We we heard Kurt's translation translated that first verse, all who are weary. And the first thing we need to grasp if we're going to hear this message from Jesus this morning is that all of us are in desperate need of rest. And of all mornings, today is a good morning to remind us of that. And this is, I think this is also pretty self-evident in our culture, though, how, how weary and heavy laden we are. I have, I have no research to back this up, but I think, if you ask me, the most common responses to the question, how are you, are good. That's one. Busy is another one. Or tired. And maybe, maybe that's just like my household and, and our weaknesses that's showing in that, that assumption of mine, but it, that does seem right to me. Sometimes we even will combine all, that, all of those things. We'll say something like, I'm good, tired, but good. Or like, we're, we're busy, but it's a good busy. Maybe there's just like, there's some psychoanalysis you can do right there of me. But I, but I do, I think there's something there. There is something about us as a country, as a culture, and maybe just as human beings, as, as limited people, that produces a constant deficiency in us that, that may, means that many of us just simply always feel tired. A culture of multitasking, a culture, culture where metrics like likes and retweets cast a, a shadow over our every post A culture in which we are defined by our jobs and our success. A culture where we have long boasted, where we this is the place where anyone can come and and be and achieve anything as long as they work hard enough. It's a culture of restlessness. And I could I could cite some statistics about sleep deprivation and and, and physical exhaustion, em- employee burnout is, is a big thing in, in, in our, our, the cultural uh, zen, zen, zeitgeist right now. But instead, I just want to ask you to examine your own heart. Are you tired? Are you tired of constantly having, feeling pressured to cultivate your home or your family or your life in in a way that lives up to Instagram? Are you you tired of the responsibility of of being a parent and and consistently feeling uncertain and unworthy? Are you tired of having to put on a happy face as you come to church on Sunday mornings and ensuring everybody that you have it all together? Are you tired? Friends, I, I want to be clear here. I'm not just talking about physical exhaustion, although we, we have that. The, the physical exhaustion that we have is really just a symptom. It's, it, it's not the problem. It's, it's a signpost. It's pointing us to this reality that we, we strive and we strive and we strive and we work, work, work. We, we multitask and we push our bodies to their limits Because, there's a reason we do that, because our souls are restless. They're itching with this sense of unworthiness, with this sense of falling short, this sense that I am not what I should be. And so our solution to that is, to that itch, is to work and to work and to try and make a change or try to be better. And so in in ancient Israel, when, when, when Jesus is reading these words, the 
that culture, what that itch looked like, the solution looked like, was law-keeping. It was this meticulous, heavy burden of law-keeping imposed by the Pharisees, the religious leaders at the time, where if you strove to keep without ceasing the, the, the each minute little law, day after day, week after week, then, then maybe, then your heavenly Father would accept you. So this is what the Apostle Paul calls in Galatians, a yoke of slavery, that law-keeping. And in our culture today, I think that yoke of slavery probably looks a little different. It's not necessarily, depending on, on what kind of church you grew up in, if you grew up in a really legalistic church, maybe you're familiar with that kind of pharisaical yoke of slavery. But I think for most of our culture, it looks a little different. Maybe it's a temptation to you know, build an identity and a persona on social media. Maybe it's a, a temptation to build a sense of security based on the success that we have in our jobs. Maybe it's a pressure to, 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 to post the right, uh, the right words. You have to make sure that they, they fit the current uh, it, it, social justice initiative or the right pictures on social media or the right, you know, you have to make sure you have the right witty caption. Or maybe it's just an incessant need to please the people around us whether it's a spouse or a parent or a mentor. But in all of us, and I think in every culture, we are tempted to put our identity, our security, in the things that we do and in the things that we achieve. And that will never allow us to rest. I was, uh, this week, I was watching uh, a documentary that's on Amazon Prime about uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Um, I love Lucy, right? And it, it, was, it was really good. I would recommend it. It was good. But the thing that was fascinating about it is, is these two people, this, their story is so, it, it's interwoven, the sadness and beauty is interwoven in such a, a unique way. And so the, the documentary tells this story about how they began the show, I Love Lucy, uh, about 10 years after they had been married. And for the first 10 years of their marriage, they were separated apart uh, in different parts of the country for about nine of those 10 years. Because uh, Desi was on the road with his band and, and, and Lucy was, doing, was trying to do movies and shows and all these different things. And so they actually began the show, I Love Lucy, because they wanted to be together more. And so uh, Lucille Ball, when she was approached to, to make a show, she insisted that her husband, Desi, would actually have a role on the show. And so that's how I Love Lucy was born. But the success of I Love Lucy just led to more and more work. And so they, as they grew more successful, they actually started their own production studio, Desi Lu Studios, and they, they took on more and more. So the show got bigger, and they tried to make the show bigger and better and more grand, and the studio got bigger. They, they bought out other production companies, and at one point, you hear this really fascinating line. You hear an audio tape of Desi saying in an interview, I only had two choices, either quit or get bigger. That is the way business is in the United States. And as they grew bigger and the responsibilities grew, they sought out rest in all kinds of different areas. Desi started seeking out arenas of rest in, in golfing and gambling and boating and, 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 and Lucy kind of retreated into her work and, and they grew separated and this pattern of burnout and chasing rest in all the wrong places drove this iconic couple to divorce. The thing that they created in order to bring them together actually ended up driving them apart. It stole their rest from them. Friends, the world does not hold solutions for rest. Striving for success and achievement is not going to bring rest because there's always another level to reach. Periodic, temporary relaxation and vacations, self-care, that, that, that might help us avoid, you know, temporarily help us avoid burnout, but it won't fill the yearning desire to matter, to change. Constantly consuming, whether it's good food or entertainment or the current news or trends, that won't provide rest, but actually creates in us an, a growing need to consume more. And certainly, giving in to our sins will not 
provide us with rest. Whether that's your lust, or your anger, or your jealousy, it's an insidious lie from the devil that we just can't hold out any longer. We have to give in to those things. But friends, real rest is not found in the world. Rest is found in the one who said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the rest of Jesus, friends, is a, it's a real rest. It's, it, because it's not a rest that's just like a temporary cease from work. The rest that comes from Jesus is a full and lasting rest that actually sustains us even in our work. There's, there's so many layers to the rest of Jesus. It is the rest of forgiven sins as he took the punishment for you on the cross. It is the rest of a secure identity as he invites you to be adopted into the family of God. It is the rest of completed achievement as every box was checked on the cross and in the grave. It is the rest of an unshakable hope as he prepares for you an eternally satisfying dwelling place. But I think the ultimate reason why the rest of Jesus is so fulfilling is because it is a rest that is derived from knowing God. Remember, that's the that's the first few verses that 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 couch this come to me all who weary passage. Jesus says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Now, now, what does he say? He says, hidden these things. What are these things? Well, it's the, the gospel of the kingdom. It's Jesus' message. And he goes on to say, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So, so Jesus' whole purpose here as he's, he's sending his followers out on mission, as he's going out, he's healing the sick, he's, he's bringing good news to the poor. Jesus' whole purpose is to reveal the Father to his people, that they might know God. And it's only here, after Jesus says this, that Jesus kind of switches gears, and he goes from speaking to the Father and giving thanks to him to inviting you and I, come to me and find rest. Because finding rest is knowing the Father. They're one and the same. Because knowing the Father, friends, is what we were made for. That's what we were created for. It was our purpose was to know the Father. And I I think Augustine, who's a a Christian bishop in the 5th century, said it best when he said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Brothers and sisters, you were made in the image of God. And you were made to know him. You were made to walk in the cool of the garden with him as Adam and Eve did. To know him so intimately that you could instinctively hear him and obey him as as Noah did. You were made to gaze upon him and, and have his glory reflect off of your face as it did Noah, or as it did Moses. You were made to know God. And you weren't simply made to know about him. You were made to know him, to relate with him. And the beautiful, and and I think the most restful thing about knowing God is that not only do you know him, but he knows you. J.I. Packer is one of the most influential uh, evangelical theologians of the, the 20th century. And he wrote a really famous book called Knowing God. And the whole book is about that. How do we know God better? But it includes this really important passage in one of the early chapters. He says this, but what matters supremely is not the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, that he knows God. I am graven on the palms of his hands. I am never out of his mind. 
All of my knowledge of him depends on his initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention is distracted from me, and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. Friends, in revealing himself to us through Jesus, God does not just offer us information about himself. He actually offers him his very self to us, right? So, so it's not like God is sending Jesus who, who reveals the Father to us. Remember, we just read that. Jesus reveals the Father to us. It's not like Jesus is out handing out baseball cards that, that have, you know, the picture of the Father, have a little biography on the back, have some interesting facts and stats about him. No, it, it's more like the baseball player has shown up in your living room. And he's brought a glove, and he's ready to go play catch. He's given his very self to us in Jesus. So when Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you rest, he is offering the kind of rest that comes from knowing God and being completely and utterly known by him. And there is so much freedom in being known by God. If you, if you not only know God, but you are known by him, then there's no future discovery of sin, or whether it's past sin or future sins that you might commit, that will hamper his love for you. He already knows it. You don't have to strive to maintain your reputation with someone who fully and utterly knows you. You don't have to pretend to have it all together. You don't have to compile accomplishments to earn some deeper love from him. He fully knows you. You don't have to wonder if what you did today was good enough for him. You don't have to agonize over whether or not you are pleasing him or not. If he knows every past and present and future thing about you and loves you anyway then you can rest. And this is what Jesus promises when he invites you. He he pleads with you to come to me and I will give you rest. It's a rest of knowing your maker and being fully known by him. And the reason we trust that Jesus can give us this rest is because of his heart. That's the foundation he gives you in this passage. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, (laughs) if I could do one thing for you this morning, it's to point you to the heart of Jesus. this This is the only place in the Bible where it talks about the heart of Jesus. And the heart is such an important biblical image. You look through the ways that the Bible talks about the heart, and it's more complicated than just how you feel about something, right? So, so Dane Ortland, who, who wrote that book that we recommended, he, he explains it like this. He says, when the Bible speaks of the heart, it's not merely speaking of our emotional life, but the center of all we do. It is what gets us out of bed in the morning. It is our motivation headquarters, The heart, in biblical terms, is not a part of who we are, but the center of who we are. Our heart is what defines and directs us. And so when Jesus says, what is it that defines and directs me? What is it that gets me out of bed in the morning? What's my motivation? What is it that is not merely a part of who I am, but the center of who I am? When Jesus gives us a glimpse of that, he says, I am gentle and lowly of heart. This is the foundation of of our confidence and coming to him, friends. That at the core of his being, Jesus is not high and exalted. At the core of his being, he is not severe and examining. At the core of his being, he is gentle and lowly in heart. Now, he's not gentle and lowly in heart to everybody indiscriminately. He just got done saying, and right before our passage, a a warning to those who reject his message. But to those who come to him, Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. 
He is gentle. Sometimes that word is translated meek. If you're familiar with the the old King James uh, translation of this passage, you'll probably remember it being meek and lowly. But I like gentle because our conception of meekness is often connected with weakness, right? But that's not really what this word means. That's a little lopsided. Meekness or gentleness in this conception is more like strength under control. Right, so I, I think about like an, an alligator, right, who has just these incredibly powerful jaws and yet at the same time will carry her babies in her mouth. This is the king of the universe who is speaking in these passages, whose strength can calm the waves and, and the storm that we saw a few weeks ago. He can move the mountains. He is not absent strength. And yet those same powerful hands that molded the heavens and earth also reach out lovingly to cup the face of his people. No matter how frail you might feel or how weak you might feel, when you come to Jesus, he does not deal with you with his power and austerity. He looks at you with compassion, with tenderness. This is the gentle heart of Jesus that the prophet Isaiah says, a bruised reed he will not break. Did any any of you ever play with cattails when you were a kid? I used to love playing with cattails when we would see them. You know, we'd we'd break one off and we'd kind of like hit each other with them. That's what we would do. (laughs) But it's not hard for one of those, those reeds to snap and then it's just limp. But so compassionate is Jesus, so in control of his own strength, that he picks up those bruised and limp reeds without ever breaking them. In fact, he binds them back up. The one who invites you to come to him here today is the one who knows exactly how to deal with your particular bruising, whatever that might be. He's gentle, but he's also lowly. He is the infinite one. He is God of God. He is light of light, creator of the universe. And yet, he humbled himself to come down into this earth. He took on the form of a servant, Philippians says. He has voluntarily put himself in a position of lowliness. You know why? So that it would be easier for you to come to him. Because he is lowly, You will never be too low, too poor, too dumb, too wretched, too stained, too messy to come to him. All your fears of rejected are swallowed up by those words, I am gentle and lowly of heart. So on one hand, you will never be too low for him. But also, he's willing to do any lowly thing that it might take to clear that pathway for you to come to him. He has stooped to the lowest positions in order to bring you rest. He is willing to wash your feet, to bear your punishment and your humiliation. He is willing to share in your sufferings, your past sins, your present imperfections, your future failure. None of it can dig a hole in which he is is unwilling to dive into. So friends, will you come to him today? The last question I want to ask before we leave here this morning is what that looks like. How do we, how do we come to him? Because if, if these words of Jesus are true, there, there should be no barrier to keep us from coming to him. So how, how do we do it? So to answer that question, I want to go back to the very beginning where we said there's two people Jesus could be speaking to with these words. To his disciples who are faithfully trying to follow him and to the people who have just met him for the first time. So for the disciple, if you're here this morning and you're following Jesus or you're trying to, There's a lot of different ways that we can come to Jesus, whether it's in prayer or in coming to his word and seeking his face that way. 
But, but I want to point you to one specific thing this morning, and that is you can practically come to Jesus and, and seek rest in him by engaging in some intentional Sabbath keeping. And, and even just hearing that word Sabbath for you might bring up some uh, thoughts of legalism and, and uncertainty about how you're supposed to do that. There's a long history of discussion and debate in the church about whether we should consider Sundays the Sabbath and what we should be allowed to do on Sunday. And, and all of that misses the point. There's so much fruit that can be had from in, digging into the word and looking at, at where it talks about the Sabbath. But, but this morning, I just want to say this. Right after this passage where Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest, the next two stories of Jesus are all about the Sabbath. And I don't think that's an, an accident. And in both of those stories, Jesus has to do some teaching and some correcting about the perception of the Sabbath. Because again, this is the, the time where Pharisees are kind of leading the charge in the religious life of Israel, and they're really focused on this legalistic, what can we do on the Sabbath, what can't we do? They're trying to catch Jesus in the act. And Jesus has to totally redirect their, their focus and say, the Sabbath is not about you keeping the law. The Sabbath is about me. He says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He says something greater than the temple, something greater than the law, something greater than your rule keeping is here, and it is me. So brothers and sisters, I, I am eager as a church, as a people, to encourage one another to embrace this pattern of Sabbath, a, a once a week day of rest in which we practice coming to Jesus for that rest. So let me just give, me, give you a, a couple key principles in how we can do that. Uh, the first thing, you can counteract your normal rhythms as a practice of dependence, right? So the practice of, of keeping one day a week free from work is to remind ourselves that the world does not actually need us to continue to go on. One way to, to kind of lean into this is to counteract your normal rhythms rhythms for rest. So if, if all throughout the week you're sitting in front of the computer and you're answering emails, then on that day of rest, go outside and walk and engage in the Lord's creation. If you're out and you're, you're working uh, in, in the elements all day, every day, then on that day of rest, take a nap. And in the five minutes before you fall asleep, thank the Lord for giving you a time for rest. Don't give in to temptation to answer emails on Sunday. If you spend every day in your inbox, don't uh, try to avoid all the household chores that pile up throughout the week. If you're on social media every day, maybe it's a good idea to take a, a weekly break. Now, again, to be clear, this isn't about setting up a list of rules for yourself to make sure you can achieve it. It's, this is about finding rest in the person of Jesus. And so to do that, that is going to take some effort. It is going to take some planning ahead. Just like the Israelites in the desert had to collect twice as much manna on that sixth day. You might have to do some extra work during the week to ensure you can have a full day of rest. And the temptation will be for us to say, well, I, I, I really can't afford to leave that email until Monday. I, I really can't afford not to do laundry today. I really can't afford, you don't understand, this is my only day to do this chore. But listen, one of the primary emphasis on, in the Sabbath in the Old Testament is to remember that we don't find our rest in our ability to get everything done. That's not where rest comes from. It doesn't come from our abilities to keep everything together. It comes from the fact that Jesus has already paid for everything to stay together. So you find rest in him. So, so taking a day to, to force ourselves to remember that, it, it's a way to force ourselves to get rest. So I, if, you have, if you have kids, you know that they don't know when they're tired. Like, you, they can be, they'll be playing, they'll be, they'll be going hard, they'll be going 100 miles an hour, won't, won't be rubbing the eyes or anything, but as soon as you strap them in to that, that car seat and they can no longer move, you get in the car and they're out. And we're the same way. We need to build rhythms into our lives to force ourselves to rest. 
You can't just wait for the warning signs. You don't always know when you need that rest. And so the Lord has baked into the rhythm of creation this weekly period of rest. It's what you need. It is an act of dependence on him and faith that is completely countercultural. Second thing uh, is prioritize knowing God. If you're going to practice this Sabbath rest, then on that day, prioritize knowing God through the person of Jesus. The Sabbath is not primarily about rest for your bodies. Rest for your bodies on the Sabbath is good if it points you to the rest that is found in Jesus. So that the point of that is to reorient our minds on the gospel and the true freedom that's found in knowing God. So however you choose to be intentional about rest, whether it's on a, a Sunday or a different day, if that Sunday doesn't happen to work for your particular schedule, don't stop with just physical rest and counterbalances. Use the time that you're not spending to do those chores to draw near to the Lord. If you go for a walk, spend some of that time in prayer. Look at his creation and thank him for it. If you are, are, like I said, if you're taking a nap, spend five minutes beforehand reading the Bible. Have the words of the Lord running through your mind as you fall asleep. If you, if you uh, spend some time with one another, with brothers and sisters in Christ, then actually talk about God while you are together. It's, it's, I, why is it taboo for us to talk about God when we're not in this, this isn't even a church, the library, <laughs> We need to renormalize knowing him, not just individually, but together. And finally, if you just need a place to start, come to church. The purpose, this is the primary purpose that we gather every week, is to help each other rest in Jesus. We try to show each other Jesus by serving each other, by singing with each other, by, by taking communion together. This, this hour and a half, two hours that you spend here is all about seeing Jesus more clearly, that we might know God more intimately. So start coming to Jesus for rest. Start listening to his invitation by coming to his body every week. If you're trying to be his follower out on mission during the week, if you're trying to, to follow him, you're trying to put sin to death, but you're not taking time to rest in him, then ultimately, it's your ability that you are putting faith in, not Christ. And if you're finding it hard to find real rest at church, I just want to plead with you, don't give up on it. Talk to somebody about why church doesn't feel restful for you. And pers persevere in that. All right. just want to say one more thing, and that is if you are here this morning and you're seeking wouldn't count yourself as a follower of Christ. The rest that you are looking for cannot be found anywhere else. Jesus is inviting you, weary and heavy laden, to come to him. And coming to him means two things. It means trusting him, trusting that he is gentle and lowly, that he is what he says he is, trusting that when he came on this earth and died, he did so on your behalf to take the punishment for your sins, trusting that he is the only way to salvation. But it also means committing to him. It means submitting to him as king. You cannot come to Jesus unless you first admit that you are weary and broken and you cannot fill that void on your own. You can only come to Jesus in humility and submission. And to come to Jesus is to say, I surrender my constant need for control. I give it to you, Jesus. And, and that, is, that is a scary thing, to give control to somebody else. But he is gentle and lowly, friends. So come to him. Don't delay Bring your burdens, the ones that weigh you down, the ones that you're ashamed of. He is strong enough to carry them, and he is gentle enough not to crush them. Come to him, and he'll give you rest. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I... I'm... 
I don't always trust that promise. I just need to confess that to you right now, Jesus, that I do not always trust that when I come to you, you will be gentle with me and that you will give me rest. Lord, sometimes I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that you will be severe with me, that you, your disappointment will be so evident to me that I will just be crushed even further. Lord, sometimes I, I, I believe the lie of the world that I can find rest in, in, in just sitting and watching enough Netflix or consuming enough social media or, or just avoiding the work I have to do. Lord, would you help me to turn my eyes away from that lie and to turn my eyes to you? Lord, help me to believe that you are gentle and lowly in heart. Lord, help us come to you. We pray, would you give us rest? We pray these things.